Today, we are releasing further details of the government's COVID-19 vaccine and treatment strategy, setting out how vaccines will be rolled out to the Australian people. Our aim is to offer all Australians the opportunity to be vaccinated by October of this year. Australia's vaccine rollout was supposed to be our ticket to freedom, but the slow road out of the pandemic has been beset by overconfidence, political point scoring and confusion. I think our vaccination strategy has been one of the worst in the world. What happened was we both delayed and we got it wrong. And so we are way behind in terms of uh, our, the numbers and the proportion that should be vaccinated by now. This is a national crisis. Uh, this is a global crisis. And what we want to see is everybody work together in a very concerted effort to do what's right by the Australian population. Our strategy to deal with the biggest public health crisis in modern history has been shrouded in secrecy. I think one of the failures of the federal government communications has been this lack of transparency around the quantity of vaccines we have in the country, the quantity we're administering, and what we can expect. The problem is when they uh, introduce secrecy, they introduce suspicion. And now we're in the slow lane. If we look like we're slow, if we look like we're taking our time, if we look like we don't really know how well we're doing against our performance expectations, would that fill me with confidence as a citizen? Absolutely not. Tonight on Four Corners, we investigate how Australia's vaccine program has fallen short. We examine the decisions made by the federal government that have left us reliant on a vaccine many don't want and delivered a messy, confused rollout that will delay our reopening to the world. And we question the architects of our vaccine strategy. What's the fundamental thesis here? Um, the thesis is that somehow Australia's not safe. Australia is arguably the safest country in the world as we sit here. Australia's plan to combat the pandemic relies on places like this. GPs like Dr Nathan Pinskia are the backbone of our COVID vaccine rollout. Uh, today's uh, our weekend vaccine clinic, so we typically have somewhere around 250 to 300 people coming through. We start at nine in the morning, go through to five, six at night, depending upon the uh, demand. My name's Valinda, I'm one of the doctors at the clinic. I'm going to be giving you vaccines today. Before Paul I Berg is 91 and his wife Scylla is 89. They're eligible for the vaccine, but they don't know what they'll be given. Which brand of vaccination are we getting? It's the AstraZeneca. Yeah, so we get the next one 12 weeks after this one. Pfizer's only in the hospital, so anyone in the community is getting AstraZeneca. The government's not providing Pfizer yeah. in the community, OK? They're worried about the rare side effects we'll caused by the off. vaccine. Um, I've got a question. Yeah. What happens if you do get a blood clot and how does it... It's what are not the symptoms? It's increased risk at your age group. So it's only under 50 mm -hmm. years it's shown to be increased risk, so you wouldn't really have to worry about that. So I'm just going to do the immunisation, all right? Can you just roll this up further? Thank you. You ready? Yes. Good. I'm, I'm vaccinating now. What we're finding now is we've gone from very high demand to caution and concern. So the issue around vaccine hesitancy is quite legitimate, given that we've seen an increase in potential side effects uh, or syndromes, particularly around the clotting problem. That's uh, quite understandable. People are concerned that they don't want to be exposed to that. <laughs> For those who do want to get vaccinated, there's not enough to go around. I was um, disappointed that we're just not in a position where we have 
enough vaccine to be able to roll out quickly to the whole of the population. We all want to get over this and get back to normal. The last thing I want to be doing and my colleagues want to be doing is providing COVID vaccines on a continuing basis at this volume, at this pace for the next two years. It was the bleak winter of 2020 when a second wave of the virus took hold in Melbourne, leaving more than 5 million people locked down, 17,000 infected and almost 800 dead. The only escape from this crisis was finding a vaccine. The real challenge we were having getting the coronavirus in Australia under control. We'd done a great job of borders, so we were actually uh, controlling who was coming into the country, but the virus that was running around in our community was a struggle for us. So I think there were, if you go back, um, back in May, June of last year, we didn't know if there was going to be a vaccine or when there was going to be a vaccine. We didn't, there were lots of groups who were in the race to develop a vaccine. Most other countries, invested in a range of, of options. They, they hedged their bets across uh, multiple vaccine candidates. And we bet on a number of options and sadly not all of those bets came through. The government wanted a vaccine that could be made in Australia. Domestic manufacture of vaccines is one of the most crucial determinants of vaccine availability and most countries have found that. We're one of the few countries in the world that can make vaccines. It decided to back one under development at the University of Queensland. So I think that filled us with enormous hope that uh, if those vaccines were successful then we'd potentially have a, a way out of this. And I guess we also had a sense of uh, patriotism, given it was developed right here and was going to be manufactured right here. So it was a, it was a great story, really, in terms of uh, being developed locally. Why did we put so much faith in vaccines that could be made in Australia? Well, supply is a, has been an absolutely critical part of our national strategy from the outset. Uh, we foresaw what's occurred in uh, Europe and North America without ever knowing what would be the specific outcome. We could see vaccine nationalism, international supply chain challenges, uh, countries withholding vaccines. And when I look at the world now, uh, I am absolutely reaffirmed that the need for domestic production was a fundamental component. Not the only component, but a fundamental component. Around the world, other countries were moving quickly to secure deals with a range of vaccine developers, including Pfizer. Today, my administration reached a historic agreement with Pfizer to produce and deliver 100 million doses of their vaccine immediately following its approval. Hopefully, the approval process will go very quickly, and we think we have a winner there. Pfizer told a Senate committee it approached the government in June to begin talks about vaccine supply. But a deal would not be made for four months. Pfizer contacted Australia in June. A deal wasn't inked until November. Why did that take so long? Well, there are multiple elements. We were waiting for clinical trial results. Um, that was the medical advice um, that, uh, remember this, Given that the world had never had uh, an mRNA vaccine, uh, that it was fundamental to ensure the safety, that there were no unintended complications, uh, that uh, there were no side effects that were uh, deemed to be uh, unacceptable, uh, and that there was the capacity to produce. And so the uh, advice we had was uh, once we'd been able to reach agreement, uh, proceed at that point. Uh, in fact, your presumption there is incorrect about Pfizer contacting Australia. Uh, Pfizer... Did Pfizer say they contacted Australia? No. Uh, the difference here is that uh, we had been in informal discussions. Pfizer was not allowed to commence negotiations 
Only once they were allowed to commence negotiations did they notify us that they were free to turn our informal conversations into informal ones. The other contender backed by the government was the AstraZeneca vaccine, developed by researchers in the UK. Like the University of Queensland vaccine, it could be made onshore at the CSL plant in Melbourne. Well, it was University of Oxford, so it came from a very good lineage. The science and the history of the vaccine development itself had its origins in other candidates against Ebola and other diseases, and we already knew that the platform was likely to be successful, and it came from a world-renowned group. In addition, and most importantly, the actual cost was dramatically lower than the cost of all the other vaccines. This is the cheapest vaccine. It can be administered, um, rolled out through just a simple cold chain. It doesn't need ultra-cold logistics. And it was really going to be the vaccine um, that was going to be the one for the majority of the world. In August, the government convened the first meeting of a group of experts, the Science and Industry Technical Advisory Group, or CITAG, whose role it was to advise the government on the procurement of vaccines. Professor Alan Cheng is a member of the group. What was the purpose of the first CITAG meeting back in mid-August? There was um, a number of um, uh, pre-purchase agreements that were uh, being considered and, um, and part of it was to look at that sort of landscape um, and say, well, you know, does this look like a good investment to make? And I think, and I can't remember the exact order, but um, I think AstraZeneca was one of, those, one of the first ones. Within days, the Prime Minister visited the AstraZeneca headquarters in Sydney to reveal that Australia had signed a letter of intent with the vaccine company. We're here today to announce that we've uh, signed a letter of intent with AstraZeneca, uh, which will enable uh, to Australia to access, should it be successful, uh, the vaccine for COVID-19 here in Australia, manufactured here in Australia, distributed free to 25 million Australians in the event that those trials prove successful. We've lacked transparency in this whole vaccine procurement story. And that letter was a classic example where, in fact, what was announced was a deal. But when you actually looked at the letter, it was just extraordinary. It was just that they had a nice meeting and we might do a deal sometime in the future was the implication. Over time, state governments would become increasingly frustrated that they were being sidelined. Throughout last year, it was very clear that the Commonwealth wanted to keep uh, the vaccine planning to themselves, and, and they, 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 they did that throughout. We found out about, um, for example, the purchases of the different vaccine products when uh, the health minister and the prime minister called press conferences and, and made those announcements. We just weren't provided with much information at all at that stage. All we really had were announcements. You know, one day we've bought 20 million of this, the next day we've bought 40 million of, of something else. No, there wasn't really any other, any other information outside of what was provided in those press conferences. Stephen Miles, the Queensland Deputy Premier, says a lot of the information that they received was via press conference and press release. Why weren't they told earlier? Some of the, 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 the commercial deals, uh, they've had to be announced really quickly because the companies, once we've signed the contract, they have disclosure obligations and they have said, you know, if you don't go out now, we will disclose to the market. So there has been uh, some pressure to make those announcements, but uh, we try where we can to share information with the states and territories. Jane Holton ran the Commonwealth Health Department for 12 years. She's been at the forefront of global efforts to develop COVID vaccines and was concerned Australia was moving too slowly. The US government had pre-purchased six vaccines. Uh, the UK had pre-purchased five. And these were large deals. We knew that 2.4 billion doses had been pre-ordered by the US government and 340 million doses had been pre-ordered by the UK. So I was getting a little anxious um, that we should strike some deals as well. <laughs> As 
Australia finally struck deals with AstraZeneca and the University of Queensland for a combined 85 million doses. You ready? But AstraZeneca was soon in trouble after problems with its trial results. Okay, so I need a scratch. They announced a 70% efficacy rate. And in fact, that was not a valid announcement because it was two separate trials. So one trial showed a 62% efficacy and another trial, which was a mistaken dosage, showed a 90% efficacy where they gave a half dose followed by a full dose. And they combined those two trials and you can't do that. Jim Buttery is an advisor to the Therapeutic Goods Administration, which approved AstraZeneca for use in Australia. Yeah, I don't think the company did themselves any favours in having variable information that uh, sometimes needed to be updated uh, after the request of regulators. I don't think we can say it fueled the hesitancy when they are seen, but it certainly wouldn't have helped. With concerns emerging about AstraZeneca, disaster struck the other arm of Australia's locally made strategy. Volunteers who'd received the University of Queensland vaccine were testing positive to HIV because a fragment of HIV protein was used in the vaccine. So it's absolutely correct that it was a false positive, so there was no risk of anyone getting HIV. On the other hand, if you have a vaccine that is giving people a positive HIV test, even in Australia, that can cause a major concern, both for the people that have a false positive test and also for confidence in the vaccine. Yeah, I was definitely disappointed. I mean, obviously, you know, our focus was on making sure our volunteers were safe and we communicated that to our volunteers and looked after our volunteers. That was, you know, clearly my focus at that time. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was really disappointing. I mean, you know, that, that was a project that had started before COVID um, in terms of being able to prepare for an emerging pandemic. The UQ vaccine trials were abandoned, leaving Australia's domestic production strategy reliant on AstraZeneca. That was a moment of just profound disappointment that uh, a vaccine that uh, uh, could have been Australian made uh, was by all early trial results uh, highly safe and highly effective, wouldn't be available. Then we made um, three decisions to terminate the, uh, the contract um, and then to use the clauses in both the uh, uh, CSL AstraZeneca and Novavax contract to add to the vaccines that we'd purchased. After months of discussions, the government had also secured 10 million shots of Pfizer's vaccine. I have no idea why that order was so small. One of the problems with ordering these vaccines, and it isn't an easy decision to make, is that if you think you're going to have to have a backup vaccine, you're going to have a backup vaccine for 25 million Australians, which means 50 million vaccines. They should have ordered 50 million if they really thought that that's going to be a backup vaccine. 10 million is not a backup for anything. We had a very small order initially for Pfizer, for 10, 10 million. million doses. Why was it so small? That was the medical advice. Why would the medical advice be to, to have enough vaccinations for 5 million people? We needed a backup. Uh, well, um, the world has never had, and this was something which um, Professor Murphy and the Scientific Advisory Committee uh, were very clear on, um, the world has never had an mRNA vaccine previously. But as we saw clinical trial results uh, and developed more confidence in two things, firstly, the uh, safety, and secondly, the efficacy, uh, then we were able to look at the production. The error in what you're suggesting is that we could have had more supply earlier. Um, there's a difference here between the capacity to order and the capacity to deliver. And so what we have done is always look at what was safe, what was effective and what was available. And uh, the uh, capacity to deliver in Australia has been at the maximum level under the Pfizer contract. The Health Minister said that the initial medical advice was to order uh, enough Pfizer for 5 million people, 10 million doses. Mm. Why was the advice to order so, so few doses? 
So we made a strategic investment, but that investment was based on the fact that we had options to buy more should phase three trials be positive, and we did that. We bought 10 million, then we bought and we increased it to 20, and now we've increased it to 40. So we've strategically invested in it the whole way through. Independent Senator Rex Patrick has been trying to get information from the government about its strategy. Well, I've made a request to get access to the government's vaccine rollout strategy. You can see this is uh, Greg Hunt's letterhead and uh, this is what uh, the Australian government are prepared to share with the Australian public. And you can see that it's just blank page after blank page uh, where they have redacted it. I don't think Australians will mind or would mind if uh, mistakes were made along the way. If people are open and transparent about what they're doing, uh, people can uh, you know, share the journey and uh, they'll understand that uh, this was a difficult task and, and it wasn't going to go 100% uh, correctly. The problem is when they uh, introduce secrecy, they introduce suspicion. In terms of transparency, um, we, uh, we can only disclose what our commercial deals allow us to disclose. So if we have a commercial in confidence provision in our purchasing clause, we'd be breaching that and we have to have to comply with that. I, I would agree with you that the the more transparency the better. And that's what we've tried to do. In January the government held another press conference to announce Australia's COVID-19 vaccine rollout strategy. The first shipments of vaccines were expected the next month. The government made clear it would be in charge of distribution. It's a federal vaccination policy, but with all vaccines, uh, they are done in partnership with the states and we've been following those processes. This is uh, not the usual um, uh, vaccination arrangement that we'd have given its uh, significance and on this occasion the federal uh, element of this uh, vaccination policy has been uh, driven very much uh, by the health secretary. I think they were um, hoping that uh, the response rolled out well uh, and that would have put them in a good uh, position politically uh, to have an election. Basically, the, the Commonwealth wanted to get the credit. So if you think back to 2020, all the action in the health field was state action. The states were taking the decisions to restrict, states were responsible for testing and, train, and, and uh, tracing and, and uh, isolation and so on. And the, the Commonwealth basically had no role on the health side after they took the decision to close the borders. And so it was basically state action. The Commonwealth said, this is somewhere we can lead. We're going to pay for the vaccines, $4 billion, a lot of money. We're going to get every skerrick of publicity from that $4 billion. Queensland's Deputy Premier Stephen Miles believed the federal government was bypassing the states. Certainly I think the Commonwealth could have more, worked more closely with the states. We have established vaccine processes that we roll out each and every day, each and every year, and for some reason decisions were made not to use uh, that that collaborative program that uh, there would be more control in the, in the hands of the Commonwealth. And I, th I think uh, what we know from throughout the pandemic is that uh, each of our jurisdictions are, are good at different things and the states are very good at service delivery, particularly health service delivery. And if we'd used the more established programs for rolling out the vaccine, I think we would be in a better place. How much better is hard to tell because ultimately it was all throttled by access to the vaccine, just number of vaccines. The vaccination program in Australia is carried out every year by GPs. This was also carried out by GPs. In addition to that, the Pfizer vaccine was provided to the states. Uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine has been available to the states and uh, some have taken it up, some haven't. Where they have taken it up, we've been grateful to supply and there's no state which has uh, been seeking more than their maximum available supply at this point in time. The rollout began on February 21. Among the first to be vaccinated were frontline health and quarantine workers and the Prime Minister himself. Any questions or issues? No one. 
Ready to go. Ready to go. Just like the country. <laughs> Excellent. Scott Morrison had set an ambitious target that the vaccine would be offered to every Australian by October. But just the average Joe, when are they going to be able to get the jab? Well, th there, were, there were a lot of average Joes and Jills who work in aged care and disability care and who have disabilities and work, live in aged care facilities or on border force or do hotel quarantine. Uh, they're the priorities. I'll let Greg go through the, the, the next couple of steps. Uh, but uh, this is about getting through the whole population. We said we'd get there by October and uh, that's... we're on track. Then major supply issues began to emerge. Local production of AstraZeneca was proceeding slowly. The first imported batch arrived at the end of February, but then the supply from Europe suddenly stopped. I think there were 3.8 million doses of AstraZeneca which were due to come to Australia that um, didn't arrive. Um, uh, and I understand that, you know, probably put things back a fair way. The flow of vaccines into the distribution networks just weren't happening. And so there were just everything that could possibly go wrong went wrong. I think one of the failures of the federal government communications has been this lack of transparency around the quantity of vaccines we have in the country, the quantity we're administering, and what we can expect. While the states administered most of the vaccinations, the federal government controlled the flow of vaccines and its supply was unreliable. For whatever reason, the Commonwealth decided to send them direct to hospitals. And so uh, we didn't know how many vaccines would be arriving each day. We had uh, hospitals with people booked in, not knowing what vaccines would arrive that day. We had uh, vaccines go astray. We, one of our hospitals received a batch of vaccines that were meant to go to a hospital in Tasmania. Under the government's plan, GPs would have a major role in vaccinating the general public. Initially, that was a real plus, you know, 4,000 plus GPs, uh, clinics and so on. And But I think that it's proven to be difficult um, because, one, you've got to distribute vaccine to these clinics. And it's... Um, I, I, GPs themselves have not been happy, right? They just feel that they invested a lot of time and, you know, effort and capital in setting up their clinics for vaccination, only to then find that they were receiving 50 doses a week. At Dr Nathan Pinsky's clinic in Melbourne's Bentley, workers were overwhelmed by demand for the first round of vaccinations. When the announcements were made by the government that the vaccine program in general practice was commencing, our phones ran hot. People looked up the national uh, vaccination uh, appointment system and they saw us. We, for some reason, came up top of the list in Bentley and we got flooded with phone calls. We think um, on some days we were getting several thousand calls a day. But the delivery of the vaccines has been chaotic. Have the vaccinations arrived, Fagisha? Yes, ma'am. It came yesterday around 3.30. We got the next 400 doses. The challenge for us is that you order the vaccine and then you sit there and you wait uh, and you wait and you wait and you think it'll probably come on Wednesday and it might come on Wednesday and it didn't come on Wednesday. And you get to Thursday, has it rolled up? And then by Friday, should I be calling someone? And then if you do that, you're not sure it's still coming because you've got no tracking and tracing. When you're talking about one of the most complex logistical exercises, getting, you know, really restricted doses we had at that time, so just-in-time delivery to, you know, close to 5,000 primary care points of contact, it's complex and there will be issues, there'll be teething issues. And the, the booking system, people people didn't heed our warning to, to wait until more GPs came online. They rushed the system. And those things often happen when you have a big program rollout. But the GP rollout has gone extremely well. In March, news broke that triggered a crisis of confidence in AstraZeneca. 
This is the other big vaccine story of the day. It started when there were reports of severe blood clots of people in Austria. In Austria, a 49-year-old woman died after receiving the AstraZeneca vaccine. The country halted its rollout. By mid-March, several other European nations had followed suit. The biggest member states of the European Union have now joined the list of nations questioning the performance of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Germany, France, Spain and Italy are all taking the precautionary measure of suspending use of the vaccine. Despite the news, Australia remained committed to AstraZeneca. All of the evidence that we have seen suggests that there is no increase above what you'd expect in that population, in the vaccinated population of these thrombotic events. But clearly there's anxiety when you've got new vaccines and we understand that people want to be cautious. But we are very confident in Australia that those incidents uh, that have been reported in Europe and people have taken a highly precautionary approach, that they are not a, a significant issue. We've not seen any issue at all. It wasn't clear at the beginning what exactly it was that we were looking at. So there had been these reports of thrombosis, but thrombosis isn't that uncommon. We hadn't had any cases in Australia and we were looking to, you know, Europe and the UK where the, you know, given 20 million doses to say, well, are they seeing anything um, important? And therefore, you know, if they start to put out warnings, that's when we would start to, um, you know, to mirror that. Then on the 2nd of April, a 44-year-old Melbourne man was hospitalised with blood clots. He'd been vaccinated with AstraZeneca. It's a severe, devastating case for the patient. Um, we were on alert because of the information that had come out um, from Europe. A small number of people have developed a very rare and very severe form of clotting in association with low platelets, which are the bits of the blood that help form clots. And the risk of death is, is quite high, isn't it? It is. It's been described at somewhere between 20 and 25% in the large case series from Europe. Members of Australia's advisory committees had a tough decision to make. And so essentially what the committees had to weigh up is a rare recognised risk of a vaccine to the probability that we're going to get further episodes of COVID exposure if we're unvaccinated and the devastation that might cause. On the 8th of April, Australia's advice changed, recommending AstraZeneca only for people over 50. The health advice is that the AstraZeneca vaccine for persons aged over 50 is, is well advised because their risk, should um, there be an outbreak of COVID-19, they would be very exposed to that risk. They are the most vulnerable group in the, in the country. And so it's important for them to be vaccinated because the vaccine protects against very serious illness. So we think the risk in younger people um, is probably around the order of um, two to four per 100,000. Um, so that's a pretty small risk still, but um, it's starting to get into the territory where we think that is starting to outweigh the benefit. Well, what we followed exactly was um, the statement of the European Medicines Agency and the UK medical regulator within a 24-hour period. And uh, they had major vaccine programs and uh, indeed the World Health Organisation, and all of them, by the way, uh, you know, of the European Medicines Agency and the UK and the World Health Organisation continue to emphasise AstraZeneca as an important part of it. Uh, we put in a more conservative, a more conservative uh, age limit than some countries which have none, uh, than uh, South Korea and the UK, for example. <laughs> Of around 2.1 million doses of AstraZeneca given to Australians, 24 people have suffered rare clotting believed to be linked to the vaccine, one of whom died. It becomes difficult in a country like Australia, where we are effectively zero COVID, to try and persuade people to take a vaccine um, that might kill them or might leave them with a disability when they're not likely to die of COVID themselves. Problems with AstraZeneca 
have fueled concerns about vaccine safety. This is Melbourne's Royal Exhibition Building, a high volume mass vaccination hub. Places like this are essential if the nation is to get vaccinated quickly, as long as people turn up. The problem is, today, there's hardly anyone here. You don't need to go far to find people worried about clots. Just a couple of blocks away, in Ligon Street, Carlton. To be honest, when I heard about the um, clot, um, you know, clotting problems, is I'm a bit scared. And now with um, Melbourne Health Policy that AstraZeneca only for staff over 50, and Pfizer only for staff, you know, below 50, and I'm 52, so sort of, sort of, I have no choice. I plan to have a jab on Monday or on the weekend and it, in, at hospital, at the hospital. Right, ground. and it's going to be AstraZeneca. <laughs> I guess, yeah, my husband convinced me that I'm not going to have a clotting problem or anything. I think both of us would generally support vaccines, you know, Definitely. very strongly, the children and everything else. So it's not about that, it's more, uh, yes, I don't know, wanting to know that it's safe, maybe don't feel quite 100% sure mm. about it. So what vaccine will you get? Um, well, look, the, the Pfizer vaccine clearly would be a preference. Um, I've spoken to a number of people. They haven't had any issues with, with either of the vaccines. Uh, I don't know that I'll have a choice, but maybe in six months' time I will. Uh, I'm now open to be eligible to get the vaccine, but um, I personally won't, won't be rational. I do think it's time to start dealing with people's concerns and their fears to actually explain why we need herd immunity and how we're going to get it. And the short answer to that is in two ways. One, you get vaccinated and or two, you get the virus. And if you think about it, we're not going to keep this virus out of Australia forever. We can't keep it out forever. So we have to get to a point of herd immunity in order that we can go back to life as I think we all like to live it. The biggest impact on hesitancy is, um, frankly, sensationalist media reporting. I would have thought that the blood clots that AstraZeneca uh, causes, very rare risk yeah. of blood clots, but yeah. nevertheless a real risk and people are frightened of it, that yes. that's the thing that's impacting it. It hesitancy. is, but it depends how you report it. Um, it of course it's a, it, it is a factor, but it sometimes has been reported, um, you know, in a in a not particularly balanced way, and some people have reported it in a very balanced way. We want to be transparent, but we want people to understand that the risk of this blood clot is really tiny, and if you're a person, a vulnerable person, the risk of severe COVID is high. Australia's goal of vaccinating the nation by October has been abandoned. So far, 3.6 million doses have been given to Australians. All right, so are you on any blood thinners? No. no. Are you pregnant, breastfeeding, no. or trying? No. No. So is this your first or second, second dose? dose? Second How'd your first one go? OK, sore arm, but nothing yeah. drastic. The slow rate of vaccination has left the country exposed, and medical experts are warning that there will be another wave of COVID-19. This hospital was purpose-built after SARS in preparation for the next pandemic. It has a specially designed ward with isolation rooms which operate under negative pressure so air blows into the room, not out into the corridor. Right now, the ward is just half full, but that won't last. Infectious disease specialist Dr John Gerard believes that uncontrolled spread of the virus is inevitable. I have no doubt that sometime in the next 12 months, this hospital will be used for the purpose for which it's designed. I think we'll have small outbreaks and they'll get bigger and eventually we'll lose control and it will spread. That's happened in the past. It happened, for example, in 2009 with the H1N1 uh, pandemic. Uh, and at some point we will lose control. Once we get above a certain critical number, uh, the virus will spread and we won't be able to contain it. But we are in this lucky position, this fortunate position at the moment, 
that we have this lull and this gives us an opportunity to vaccinate the vulnerable and to protect them for when the virus arrives. And in all your pandemic planning over the years, you never anticipated a lull, did you? No, we never did. We didn't expect we would have this, this extraordinary opportunity to vaccinate the population whilst we waited for the virus to arrive. It's an extraordinary gift, and let's hope we don't waste it. Just get this um, um, dangle beside you. Yeah, perfect. Vaccination rates need to accelerate dramatically in order to protect us. Very good. Well done. You know, look around the world what happened during the winters in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, we just can't blithely go into this winter thinking that it's all just going to be the same. Um, in Melbourne, we learned to our great cost um, uh, at the onset of winter what happened last year. With the escape from quarantine, all of a sudden it's completely out of control. Now, in order to get full herd immunity, we know we've got to get very high levels of protection, probably in excess of 70% of the target population. But frankly, even without herd immunity, the more you've immunised, the less likely it is you're going to get spread into the population. So our target should be not um, having everyone at least getting one dose by October or even by next year now is the most recent that I've heard. It should be to maximise the number of people who've had one dose before the onset of winter. The flaws in Australia's vaccine program have left us vulnerable at the very worst time of year. To get through this crisis, the government desperately needs to rebuild trust in its plans and in the vaccines themselves. I think there needs to be much greater transparency and I, have, I don't understand why we don't because people's confidence is being sapped away at the moment by the schmozzle that's taking place in the vaccination program. Well, our medical advice is clear and, and my job is to emphasise the medical advice. What we're saying to Australians is uh, we have safe and effective vaccines, uh, we have the capacity for every Australian to be vaccinated and, and this is your chance uh, to protect yourself and to protect your families. It's clear the virus hasn't gone away. It will come back in this country. And if we have really low levels of vaccination at that point in time, then the impact of that will be far greater than it could have been otherwise. I am concerned that uh, Australians seem to believe that this virus is just going to go away. It's not. It's going to come here. And if you're not vaccinated, there is a good chance you will be infected. Mm -hmm.